Hello all, welcome. Uh, hopefully you can hear me and see me. Uh, if you have any audio problems or if you have any trouble seeing things as we go along, uh, please go ahead and type it in the chat box uh, where we've been communicating so far. Uh, and we'll also leave questions uh, for the chat box. So uh, we've turned on audio, particularly when we have small groups like this before, but often it ends up causing more problems than it's worth. Uh, so if you have questions, type them in the box. I will keep my eye on the chat and uh, respond to anything that I see. Uh, and um, also a few other housekeeping things. This will probably take about 45 minutes, I would guess. Uh, if you cannot stay for the entirety or if you know another uh, reviewer that's not going to have a chance to see this today, uh, we do record these sessions and we will be posting one of the recordings either from this morning uh, or for this one. Uh, in a little bit, we'll put it up on our YouTube channel. I'll email it out to all the reviewers uh, so you can go back on this when you inevitably forget half of what I say today uh, because there's, there's just a lot. Uh, so you can go back and see it. And I also have a few documents online that you can go to and, uh, and look at it, essentially a bullet list of the salient points from what we're going to talk about today. But being here and having the discussion uh, live with me is, gives you the opportunity to ask any questions that may come up. Uh, and it will also allow you to see what you're going to be doing uh, for this uh, review process compared to just reading a few notes online. So with that, let me start by saying thank you. Uh, you're going to hear this from me again and again throughout the uh, next few weeks while you're participating in this program, uh, but it is heartfelt. We could not do this process without you. Uh, we receive now on average of uh, roughly 30 uh, proposals each round. That's 60 proposals a year. This round we received 28. This is our slower of the two, uh, two uh, rig rounds. And in addition to 28 proposals, we often have around 70 reviewers uh, that volunteer their time, as you have done, uh, to come up. Um, no, unfortunately, Dean, I'm sorry, there's no uh, call in for this one. Um, so perhaps uh, try disconnecting, reconnecting. Uh, worst case scenario, we will have a video available. Uh, so uh, about 70 reviewers come in each round and uh, dedicate their time to this process, uh, about three hours often uh, each uh, for, for these reviews. So for each of those 70 reviewers, spending about three hours reading proposals, responding proposals. And I have to tell you that uh, whether or not you've ever participated in a grant process before, this one is probably uh, different than most that you've ever participated in. And the reason for that is that we view this grant process as an educational program for all involved, for reviewers, uh, for proposers, uh, for principal investigators, and for ourselves as we continue to refine this, this program. Uh, for our reviewers, of those 70 reviewers, uh, some are coming on and have never, uh, <laughs> perfect timing, and have never uh, conducted a, a review before, have never participated in any sort of review of proposals before. Others are coming in as senior faculty members who have conducted hundreds of reviews uh, for agencies ranging from NSF to, uh, to NIH to, you know, uh, here at Penn State. Uh, so we have a, a breadth of experience that comes to the table. And we try to scaffold things so that those who may not have as much experience can be provided the opportunity to learn and grow through their interactions with those who may have a bit more experience. But one of the reasons why we try to get as diverse a group as possible uh, to these reviews is that uh, the, the eye for innovation or the eye for those things that are going to affect learning in the future uh, it is not unique to those who have been in the field for a long time, that have conducted a lot of reviews, that have been involved in these processes before. Uh, it's one of the reasons why this grant process is for faculty, staff, or students, undergrad or graduate students, because innovative ideas are not limited to senior faculty members. Uh, and it's the same thing with reviewers. Uh, and when you come to the table, whether you've done a review before or not, you come to the table with insights. Uh, that are usually unique. And so we look for those and we appreciate those. When I say we, not just COIL in helping us to, to, to decide on which proposals uh, we are going to fund, but also for the principal investigators. I'll say PIs throughout the rest of this, uh, but principal investigators. 
uh, these are individuals that are leading teams uh, to, to explore these new and innovative ideas that they have. And sometimes these ideas are at the very beginning stages and need some refinement. And what you are going to be able to provide to them is that uh, is a set of pointers toward refining those ideas. Uh, in the past, we have uh, we have provided the feedback that you will give us back to to the uh, principal investigators, and often they're receiving up to ten pages in feedback uh, from nine to eleven reviewers that are all putting their eyes on these proposals. That feedback is indispensable. I'll give a really quick anecdote. Uh, in our third round, uh, we are now entering into our eighth round of rigs, but in our third round of rigs, we had a graduate student that submitted an idea, and uh, the proposal did not do well in the review process. Uh, was was one of the, the lower ranked uh, proposals when all was said and done, but received that 10 pages of feedback uh, from from reviewers who took their time to fill out comments and to, to tell the PI where they could refine their idea, where their idea was lacking, new directions they could go. Then that PI took a round off and submitted in the fifth round. When they submitted that same proposal, refined, changed, modified, took those comments to heart and applied them, when that proposal was resubmitted in the fifth round, it was our top ranked proposal. The next round, that same PI submitted another idea, and taking those lessons learned in that first experience, was able to submit another idea, which was, again, a top-ranked proposal. And why, why I'm telling you this is that your comments and your feedback that you give do more than simply justify the scores that you give on these reviews. It also helps sometimes young researchers, novice researchers, Sometimes researchers who have been in this and been at the game for quite some time, but those comments and feedback help them to refine their ideas and build out better proposals for the future, whether it's for a coil rig in a future round or whether it's for something larger, uh, which we've had many of our ideas go on to much, much larger lives uh, than what they are here. Our rigs are intended to be seed funding, seed funding to help get new and innovative ideas off the ground. And the entire process we've built has been built around trying to uh, facilitate and foster that, to get these new, fresh, innovative ideas off the ground and get them to the stage where they could possibly attract external funding that could both come into the university as well as help develop these ideas to impact more learners in the long run. So what we're going to be doing today is uh, we're going to essentially walk through the process, the tools that you're going to use, the forms that you're going to uh, have access to. We're going to walk through all of that so that you can see what this is going to look like. You're going to receive an email from me tomorrow uh, before 10 a.m. is my goal. I'm working on, I was working on this just before this uh, webinar. To, I'm going to assign you four proposals. Uh, I'm looking at conflicts of interest right now. I'm looking at your self-identified areas of expertise, trying to line all of that up. And you're going to receive an email from me with a number of different links, a uh, uh, basic structure of how this will all work, and uh, four different proposals listed. Each one of the proposals uh, takes about 45 minutes to both read and then review, uh, based on averages. Everyone, everyone is different. Uh, you will, however, have access to every proposal that has been submitted. And many times reviewers like to go in and look at other proposals. And if you do that, I also would request that you may be willing to review additional proposals. Completely up to you. Uh, but in addition to the four that you are assigned, you are open to reviewing any additional that you would like, as long as there are no apparent conflicts of interest. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, if there are any conflicts of interest, uh, then I'd have to discard your scores, and I'll look for those conflicts of interest once reviews are submitted. Uh, but please uh, uh, self-regulate yourself there. Look at the proposals. If you see anything that looks like a conflict of interest, uh, which means that you would not be able to fairly review uh, that proposal uh, due to your relationships with a member of the team or, or uh, supervisory relationships or anything of that sort, 
Uh, if there are conflicts of interest, read the proposal, that's fine, just don't submit a review. On the other hand, if for something, if for some reason something comes up and you are not able to conduct four reviews, please just send me an email and let me know and I will look at reassigning those proposals. My goal is to have between 9 and 11 reviews for each proposal. So if you don't tell me that you can't do one and then you don't, then that negatively affects the number of reviews that that proposal gets. So please just tell me up front, it's not a big deal, I will do a reassignment. Same thing if I happen to miss a conflict of interest. Uh, we have external uh, reviewers, but here at Penn State in particular, for as large as we are, we are a small community and conflicts of interest are difficult to avoid. If you identify any conflicts of interest that I miss, please let me know. I will reassign any of the proposals. Uh, so the question is, will you be able to see other reviews of a proposal after you submit yours? Uh, yes and no. Yes, you will be able to see them prior to the review meeting, uh, which is that meeting on June 3rd. No, you will not be able to see them immediately. Uh, once reviews are submitted, I will take them, I will aggregate them on June 1st, and then I will put them into a document that I will then send out to everyone. So you'll be able to see both your review and everyone else's reviews. Uh, we don't provide access to reviews prior to that because we don't want to bias results. And reading other individuals' reviews can bias your results. Uh, so we save that until everything has been submitted. So. Where we're going to start today is uh, right here on the COIL website, which is coil.psu.edu, and I should put this in here, I guess. Um, very often, reviewers ask to see exactly what the proposers, the PIs, saw uh, when they are first looking to submit their uh, proposals, and this is where it is. Our RFP, our Request for proposal, Proposals, is on the, our website. Uh, coil.psu.edu, under Grants, and Call for Rig Proposals. There you will see everything. A lot of information that you don't need to know, you don't need to worry about, but it's all here if you have questions as you're conducting your reviews. Some of this uh, I replicate in the box folder that we're going to be exploring in just a few minutes, uh, but it this get, walks through everything that's included, including uh, what the proposal looks like, what the sections are, it goes through the criteria that you're going to be using for product for project selection, including point values for each one of the sections. There's a rubric that goes along with this that is also was also available to proposers, uh, and some other information. What I did was I extracted all the important information uh, for you, and I have put it all into one place, uh, which is a box folder. Uh, if you've never used Box, it's very similar to Dropbox or OneDrive or any of the uh, cloud-based uh, files, uh, uh, file structures. And in that folder are going to be all the documents that you could possibly need. So that's where we're going to start today. You're going to get the link uh, to that folder in the email tomorrow. And when you go to that link, which is psu.box.com slash coilrig, when you go there, you will uh, be asked to enter a password, which I'm also going to give you in that email, but I will just tell you what it is because it is the same for just about everything you're going to be doing in this review process. It is COIL RIG, all lowercase, C-O-I-L-R-I-G. Once you enter that, it will let you into the box. Uh, here is all the information that you need. Uh, let me sort it by name so it makes a little more sense. There is a folder with all the proposals. In here, you will see all 28 proposals that have been submitted. Each one is preceded by a letter, dash, and then the last name of the principal investigator. The name for the reason for that letter is to help us to easily discern between uh, proposals with individuals with the same PIs with the same last name. Uh, sometimes it can get confusing if you do. Uh, we have two uh, Wu. Um, uh, actually, they're not in here yet. They will be soon. Uh, woo 1 and Woo 2 can get confusing, but with the preceding letter it makes it a little bit easier, so that's why we do that. Uh, each one of the proposals is in here and is available to everyone, regardless of your assignments. Uh, so your four will be in here, but so will all the rest if you want to look through. I will also be uploading an index in here where you will be able to see the name of all the projects of all 28, as well as the keywords that the uh, PIs identified for their projects. And that's if you just want to look through and see what kind of innovative things were proposed 
uh, you can look through that index and get a sense of what was submitted and see if there are any others that you may be interested in reading. Uh, so that will be uh, that will be posted up uh, relatively soon, definitely before 10 a.m. tomorrow. The rest of what's in this folder is uh, is essentially the process, uh, all the pieces that you would need to complete this process. Uh, the first one is the RFP that I just showed you live on our website. This is a PDF version of it. So if you want to have it on hand, you want to print it out, it's there ready for you and waiting. The next one is essentially the bullet point version of all of the salient points of what we're talking about today. Uh, this is the how to conduct and submit reviews. It uh, walks you through all the different points, gives you URLs and passwords uh, for doing everything, my email if you have any questions, and walks you through point by point how to conduct a review. Uh, so again, once you uh, miss some of this, uh, forget some of this as we as you get your assignments tomorrow. It's all here for you to read. Uh, so the names of the reviewers know the uh, in that box of folder that I just showed that those are the uh, names of the submitters, the PIs, the principal investigators uh, for the project. So there are 28 proposals in here. Uh, your names are on a separate sheet. There are 70 reviewers, or actually 72 reviewers. Uh, so those are separate. You will see that in the uh, the tool that we use for our reviews coming up, though. Thanks for the question. Though. So that's how to conduct and submit reviews. We're going to be talking about that right now. The next few items are the tools that you're going to use. And probably, in my opinion, the most helpful one is going to be this next one, uh, which you see that these are all in number order. Number three, the rig review rubric. Uh, if you have some, if you have uh, reviewed for us in the past, you will notice some significant differences in the rubric this time around. Uh, I went through; I was never 100% satisfied with the rubric. Uh, I am I am a teacher. I will always be a teacher. I was a middle school teacher become, before coming into higher education for my PhD program, uh, and so I went back through and I retooled the rubric a bit. So it is significantly different than it was in the past. Uh, so please, if you have it from a past round, come back in here and, and look at it again. Uh, all you have to do is click on it. You can also download uh, anything out of this folder, or you can work on it live in the web. Uh, for ease of viewing, I am going to pull it up full screen here so that you can see it. And we're not going to walk through all of this. We're going to walk through the criteria using this the uh, review tool. Uh, but there is one line that I'll go through here uh, because it tends to be the point of most confusion uh, for our reviewers, or I won't even say confusion, the point of, of largest disagreement, uh, the primary reason for large standard deviations when I start looking at all the review scores, is this first line, the innovation criterion. So we'll walk through this just so you can get a sense of how the rubric works, uh, and then we'll, we'll kick over to the tool. So, this rubric, if you haven't seen a rubric before, uh, it essentially helps to guide you through the thinking process for allocation of points for each one of the 10 criteria related to the rig proposals. Uh, there, the maximum point levels for each one of the criteria range between 3 or uh, 10 as our maximum. So, in here, it helps walk you through what are the number of points you should submit uh, for a proposal after you've read it. Innovation is the one we're going to work on right now. And innovation is, is tough. If you were to get 10 people and sit them around a table and ask them to define innovation on their own, you'd probably get 8 to 10 different answers. I can say that for our director's table of six individuals uh, sitting around as a coil of directors, if you were to ask us, we'd have our own nuances, our own takes on what innovation is. And definitely what does and does not constitute something that's innovative. So what we've tried to do over a time with the rig process, like I said, this is a learning process for everyone. We've tried to refine our definition of what innovation is or what innovation is to us. Let me say that. So this may or may not gel with your personal definition of innovation, but this is the one that we are asking you to use when, when uh, evaluating these criteria for proposals. And so that I'm right on script, I'm just going to read what our definition of innovation is. COIL defines innovation 
as the research, development, or introduction of something new or novel. New or novel. Be it an idea, a device, approach, something with the intent on improving learning. So what we do after each one of these is we try to give you some guiding questions. So when you come to this criterion, you've read your proposal, you have a good idea, a good sense of what that principal investigator was, was saying they wanted to do, and you say to yourself, is this innovative? All right. How innovative was it? Is it 1 point, 2 point, 3 point, 4 point, 4, 5 point? What is it? Ask yourself these three questions that are the bullet points on here. First, is this, does this idea represent something that is new or novel? Okay, new or novel, sometimes that, that can even be up in, in the air. Would I personally identify something that is using virtual reality as new or novel? I'd say so, absolutely, particularly within the education context. Uh, virtual reality is really just starting to get its legs under it. If you were to uh, ask someone who's been in development of, of a virtual reality platform the first Oculus four or five years ago, maybe not as much. Would they say it's new or novel? Maybe not. To us, yeah, I'd say it definitely is. So we need a little bit more refinement here. All right, let's refine it a little bit more. Next bullet point. And it's stated in the negative on here. I'll state it in the positive just to be a little bit more clear. Does the idea or does the proposal represent an innovation that's a refinement on something that already exists, a technology we already have, or an approach we already use? So if it is a refinement, then to us it is not an innovation. So if you take something that we're already using, and you just want to iterate on it. You want to make it a little bit better. You want to uh, you know, sand down some of the sharp edges of it. That is not an innovation to us. That is a refinement. Or it could be a scaling. Uh, scaling is also not an innovation to us. So if you were to take an idea uh, that is already well-tread and you're just looking at using it for more people or with more people, that's not an innovation. That's a scaling issue. And this is where sometimes we get in the disagreement of between what is an invention and what is an innovation. Some use invention to mean that brand new or novel thing, and then innovation is scaling that invention. Uh, to us, not necessarily. Innovation is that new or novel idea. If it's a refinement on something that's already being done and has already been well researched, then that's not an innovation. Let's go to the next bullet point, a little bit more detail. Is the innovation simply applying something that already exists to a brand new context. This is difficult again. So let me give you an example of a proposal that has come in in the past that struggled with this particular point. Uh, a proposal that came in in the past had to do with using just-in-time video mentoring in, the nursing con in a nursing context uh, in Hershey uh, Medical. So basically what the argument was, uh, which I, I don't know enough about the field to, to, to comment on it, but uh, my understanding is that within the nursing field, uh, using video mentoring is challenging due to privacy concerns related to the, the study of medicine with real individuals, uh, particularly in the nursing context when you've got patients in front of you. And so having the video camera and uh, doing live streaming is challenging. To, to be able to do on the up and up. So what they were proposing was essentially a way of getting around a few of those issues uh, related to privacy concerns in order to do just-in-time mentoring using video cameras for nursing students. It was a, it's a great idea. Uh, to, if that's not done in the nursing field right now, that, that's a fantastic idea. But is it innovative? And our point of view was, no, it is not. Uh, just-in-time mentoring, video mentoring, streaming mentoring is relatively well-tread territory, particularly within education. Uh, this is something we've been doing with beginning and developing teachers uh, and novice teachers for years. Uh, so it is not necessarily that new or novel. It's the application of something that's already been well-researched, well-tread in a new context. That would not apply here. So again, that would not be an innovation. So I'm trying to tease it out, and as you can see from some of the things I've said, it's still hard. When I read proposals, sometimes I struggle over whether or not this is innovative. So what we try to do in this rubric is we try to 
help you flesh it out just a little bit. Those guiding questions you can ask yourself. And then as you look at point values, uh, so you can see uh, missing basically means they don't even mention innovation somewhere in their proposal. And if they don't have innovation, they've got bigger problems when it comes to the proposal. Uh, so if it's completely missing for this, you can give a zero. That's a little bit more applicable in other sections where they may be missing a dissemination plan or something of the sort. Uh, but then it starts off with one point. Uh, and what we say is, for one point, basically the idea in the proposal doesn't represent an innovation as I just defined, or the proposal doesn't really have any supporting evidence. They just say, this is an innovation, and then they don't flesh that out at all. Uh, on the other side of the spectrum, for the five, the, the innovation is clear. It is directly addressed. There is compelling evidence that it is an innovation. They give evidence that this is brand new. No one's done this before. Uh, they provide some non-examples. That is a five. And then there's everything in between. So three is an innovation the proposal may be stated or inferred. You kind of have to guess at what they're talking about for the innovation. And they give some evidence. But they don't flesh it out all the way. Maybe they don't give, give non-examples. Uh, maybe they just don't go into the depth that you're looking for, and you're still left wondering whether or not this is an innovation. So maybe that's a three point uh, for in your in your review. You go through here, and you you uh, allocate these points, and once you've done that, you go into the online tool, and you can actually give these points to each one of the criteria for each one of the proposals. You will notice a little bit of a difference between point values. In some things, you'll see innovation is worth 10 points. It is. In the rubric, however, you'll notice it only goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. There are a number of reasons for this. If you've conducted research, particularly any sort of research with, with Likert scales, you know that humans have a difficult, difficult time consistently uh, discerning between more than five points. Uh, and that's even arguable. Uh, so we have narrowed all these down to five points and provided multipliers. So you'll see at the very end of the row, there is a multiplier of two for this section. So that means that if you give it one point, it actually is going to get two points. If you give it two, it gets four, three, six, four, eight, five, ten. Um, hopefully that's relatively clear. It's a little bit more clear in the online tool that you'll see in just a second when we walk through it. Um, Yes. Uh, well, we're not going to practice it on a sample proposal. Uh, sorry. Uh, we're not going to practice this on a sample proposal, but we will actually walk through the review tool so you can see how it works live on the review tool. Um, I do have on there, um, I do have on there a test that you can go through. And on our website, let me pull that back up. On our website, if you go in there toward the bottom of the RFP, there is, there are two highly rated proposals from the past that uh, may be helpful for you, to, if you're so interested, to read through. And you can see proposals that we identified as exemplars of things that did hit the mark on all these criteria. One thing I will say is these are from past rounds, so the criteria may be a little different, uh, but it will give you a good, sen uh, good sense. Uh, so the question, can you give a half point? No, you cannot. Uh, you'll see that in just a second when we go through the review tool, you'll see what you are limited to uh, for actually assigning points. Uh, so that's innovation. That's that first line. But that's basically how the rubric works. Uh, you will see all 10 of the criteria uh, through here, each one in a box. Uh, and all of them are the one through five, with the exception of the very last, because this is only a three-point criteria. So you'll see it's either missing zero points, strongly disagree, Neither agree nor disagree or strongly agree. Uh, and again, this will be a little bit more clear when we get into the actual review tool. This rubric, print it out, have it sitting next to you. Uh, you know, after you go through it a couple times, you'll, you'll have it memorized and you'll, you'll have a good sense of it. Uh, but hopefully it can be a great tool to help bring our reviews a little bit more closely together. And particularly with innovation, help with some of our standard deviations that we've been having with innovation where there's just a large amount of disagreement. I think there's always going to be disagreement when it comes to this. Uh, this, is, this is just a, an area that is, that is rife with disagreement and when it comes to what is new, what is novel, what is innovative, and what is not. Uh, so 
there we go, box folder. Uh, so now we've gone through the RFP, uh, the instructions on how to do all of this, a recap of what we're talking about now, the rubric. There's one other thing uh, that we have in here, which is a rig review worksheet. Some people like working online, where you open up the review tool, the online review tool, and you do your review live right in there. That's perfectly fine. Others prefer to do things either printing out and writing or typing or whatever it may be. Uh, but if you prefer the writing or if you prefer the, the typing uh, without being in the review tool, there is this worksheet uh, that we give you. And basically it's what you just saw, uh, just broken down in a way that you can do your review and jot notes down for your review uh, for each one of the proposals that you do. So you'd write in the, the uh, proposal name here and you'll see that same criteria that I just walked you through a place to put in what's your score out of 10 points, what would you give it, and then a place to jot down some of your comments. Uh, I will reiterate again, as I will uh, a number of times, comments are critical. Whether you give a low score or a high score, comments are critical. So for the low score, obviously the comment is important because we need to understand and, and the proposer, the PI, needs to understand why you gave it a low score. For a high score, we also need to have some sense of what your thinking was behind that score. Because when we sit down for our reviewer meeting, uh, you may have given this a, a proposal a 10 for innovation. Someone else gave it a 2 for innovation. I need to be able to understand and represent your point of view with the 10, just as I need to be able to understand and represent the point of view of the individual with the 2. This entire process, review process, is completely anonymous. Your names will be masked. There is only one person that will know which reviewer did which review, and you're looking at them. Uh, there, and I used to have a graduate assistant, so there used to be two people uh, that did this, but she recently left, so it is one person now. No one else will know it. So you do not have to disclose yourself if you don't wish to do so. If you don't provide comments, it makes it very challenging for me to be able to represent your point of view without really needing you to step up and say, hey, I'm the person who gave it a 10 and this is why I was thinking what I was thinking. If you provide that feedback in the comment section, not only does it inform me, it informs the principal investigators whether they are funded or not to help them refine their ideas and their proposals down the line. Uh, so this is the first step. You can use this worksheet if you want. I don't want these worksheets after the fact. You can delete them, get rid of them, whatever the case may be. Uh, this is just a tool for your use if you so choose. We've we had uh, reviewers ask for it in the past, which is why you, it's uh, up here. So that's the worksheet. The next is where you're going to be spending most of your time. This is the link to review proposals. When you click on that link, it will bring you to here. This is the tool. I don't know if you've ever used Qualtrics before. This is a Qualtrics survey. Uh, and you will do, you will walk through this whole process four times, at least four times for your four proposals. You will notice that it asks for a password. Again, coil rig, one word. Hitting enter will not move you forward. You must click on the forward button throughout this entire, uh, throughout this entire review process. You have to click on the forward button and it will bring you to the first page. Please Please take your time on this page. Um, this is where you're going to be identifying who you are and you're going to be identifying which proposal you are reviewing at this moment. Uh, if you select the wrong name for yourself accidentally or if you select the wrong proposal, there are ways for me to check that and uh, usually figure out which one it was supposed to go for. Uh, but it is often a lot of work on, on my part and we have very quick turnaround times for this review process. Um, if you if you participated in grants before, it is not uncommon to have between three and six months from the submission date to the funding date. Uh, we do it all in about three and a half weeks. Um, and in two, a little over two of those weeks are uh, you conducting reviews. Uh, from the point that you are done with reviews to the point that you receive a statistical analysis of those reviews is less than 24 hours. 
So any uh, any time that you can do some of this data checking for me and make sure that things are entered correctly to begin with is greatly appreciated. On this page, you are going to select yourself. Uh, so you will go through and you will find your name. I put myself at the end here. I'm actually not the last person in the alphabet. That is amazing. Uh, so I, I am out of alphabetical order. I'm the last one there. And you will see all of the proposals uh, that are here. Uh, we have 28 uh, A through BB uh, coming through here. And then there is the test proposal. If you want to run through this uh, process and just you know kick the tires, try it out, that's fantastic. Select your name, select the ZZZ test proposal, and you can run through the whole tool uh, just to try it out and see how it works. But that's what we're going to do right now, and we'll click the forward. And you should recognize this. Uh, here it is, same terminology, same wording, same formatting as you saw in the rubric and in the RFP. Innovation, 10 points. We give you the prompt, same as we gave to the PIs, the proposers, uh, when they read the RFP. And we ask you to identify what your score is going to be. And this is where we answer the question about uh, half points. So you are locked. There is no dropping it in between. It jumps from one mark to the next. So you can give 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, or 10 points. That is a breakdown of uh, the points that you can get. And it, they correlate with the strongly disagree, disagree, neither, or neutral, agree, and strongly agree. Uh, so you will read your proposal. Maybe you do this on the worksheet. Uh, or maybe you just come and do this live in the tool and you decide what is the point value that I'm giving for this. I will say just uh, as we're passing, uh, this is also mobile friendly. If you want to do this on a phone or a tablet, uh, I don't know why you want to put yourself through that. Uh, this probably would not be very easy, particularly the comments part uh, to do on a phone, uh, but you can. Uh, you go through, you assign the point values, and then you go into the comment section. And uh, this is where you will uh, put in your insightful comment. Uh, and, uh, and usually a sentence, two sentences. Some people put paragraphs. That's great. Uh, there, it would be difficult to give too much feedback. In here. Again, thinking about that educational mission of these grants uh, for both for you to help you think through uh, applying these criteria to grants that you're reading or proposals that you're reading as well as for the principal investigators to read these comments and learn how to better construct proposals in the future and to refine their ideas that they have. Um, so you assign a point value, you will you know, put in your insightful comments and then you will click on the forward button. If something happened and I had to walk away from my computer right now, the your progress is saved uh, as long as you come back to this computer, uh, that you, the computer that you're using at the time, they're saved as cookies. Uh, so if you are doing this on your desktop and then you open it up on your uh, laptop, uh, it most likely is not going to, to save where you are and you'd have to restart that particular review. But if you come back to the same computer, it will bring dump you right into where you left off. So we talked about innovation already. Uh, and if I needed to go back, I said, oh, you know what, I need to change something. I, you can click on the back and, and navigate back and forth. Uh, but we talked about innovation. We'll talk very quickly about the other nine criteria uh, that we have for, for reviews. Uh, the next one is enhancing learning. And you know what, let me take one step back because there is one thing I want to also show you. The breakdown of what a proposal is. Um, so every proposal is different. Uh, there is no requirement for uh, formatting, but this is the these are the sections that we require. Uh, first, you'll see a cover page uh, that will have information. Uh, you really don't have to pay much attention to this. Uh, you may be interested in who the team members are. You may be interested in where the idea is coming from. Uh, but the rest of this is primarily for us at Coil. Then you'll see a 200 word abstract. It is limited to 200 words. I have done the word checking on all of those. Uh, if any proposals came in that do not adhere to these rules, uh, they will not be uh, forwarded to you for review. Uh, so you don't really have to worry about the word counts. But to get a sense, uh, these are 200 word abstracts. Then there is a 200 word innovation statement. 
this is the PI's opportunity, called an opportunity. This is the PI's opportunity to let you know in uh, no uncertain terms, in very succinct language, what is the innovation. It's their case for why you should give them a 10 in that section. Um, and in fact, I even say a succinct description of why your project should be considered innovative. Um, so that is an innovation section. Then you will see an impact on learning section, which is also 200 words. Again, a succinct statement on that, and you'll see these line up with the criteria uh, that we'll be going through in the review tool. Innovation, impact on learning, alignment with core research priorities. We'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, again, limited to 200 words. And then it gets into a five-page narrative. Uh, so with 200 words being a, a little over half a page, uh, this is really, at maximum, a seven-page double-spaced proposal. Uh, five pages for the narrative, 200-word sections to begin with, and in the narrative, they make their primary case as to why this proposal should be funded and why they're capable of, of doing this project. Um, that's the narrative, and you can see all the different uh, breakdowns of what's inside that narrative. There's a reference section. There's a team biography section. Uh, there is an estimated budget, so you can take a look at their numbers and a narrative that goes along with that, a one-page dissemination plan, and then supporting material. Some PIs go overboard with supporting material. You are expected to read everything from the dissemination plan up. Uh, all the rest of this uh, you should read. Supporting materials, you are not under ob any obligation to read those supporting materials. We have had people who have submitted 60, 70 pages of supporting materials. Again, learning experience for how to write proposals. Uh, there are others that take out the one or two pages of really key information and put it in as supporting materials. And please, look through that, read through that, skim through that uh, to help you gain a better understanding of what they're doing. Very often I encourage uh, PIs to put screenshots uh, in the supporting material section because there's not space in the five-page narrative for screenshots. Uh, and when you're developing a tool, particularly an online web-based tool, screenshots are very helpful. Uh, you will find those in these sections very often. Uh, sometimes there will be links to videos. Watch them if you'd like. Don't watch them if you don't. If it's not in the body of the uh, proposal, you are under no obligation to, to look through them. Uh, but again, uh, use your judgment and read through what you feel like you need to read through. Thanks, Adelina is actually one of our uh, PIs. Uh, uh, Adelina just read, read your comment. Uh, one of our PIs has been through this process before, and it's good to hear uh, how beneficial those comments are. I hear that again and again and again, and I see it. Uh, fun fact, 73% of resubmissions, so that means 73% of those proposals that fail the first time but are funded in subsequent rounds are, <laughs> sorry, I phrased that wrong, 73% of proposals that are, that, uh, that are not funded the first time and then are resubmitted are funded. Uh, so that shows you how beneficial those comments can be, that the vast majority of resubmissions do get funded because they take your comments, they apply them, and they help to, to fix and refine their proposals and better convey what they want to do. I often say, very often, it's not the, it's not the idea that is funded or not funded. It's the proposal. It's the way you communicate your message. It's the way you convince people uh, and, and uh, let them see your vision. Uh, so sometimes it takes a little bit of work and it takes a little bit of refinement. Uh, so enhancing learning, you'll see that there was that 200 word section. Uh, basically this is uh, the question of, is this going to impact learning in some real meaningful way? Uh, we want to know that these uh, projects could potentially have long-term impacts in teaching and learning. Or are these really niche topics or niche project that may affect 20 students somewhere, but is really not going to change learning or teaching as we know it? Um, so those are the questions that will help you to, to determine what your point value is. What we are looking for is we're looking for those moonshots. We're looking for those really great ideas uh, and those things that can have the most impact, most bang for our buck. We'll kind of get into that in another criteria later. Uh, but you'll select a, uh, a score there, and you'll put in your insightful comments again, and move on. 
alignment with COIL themes of personalization and student retention. We just you saw that there's a 200 word section for this. Uh, COIL every year identifies themes uh, by which we help to uh, narrow the focus and use of our resources. Uh, currently, the two themes are personalization and retention. These are both relatively big buckets. You can fit a lot under these two banners. Uh, and that is what our PIs are going to be trying to do, is to make the case that their project falls under one of these. Uh, and we define personalization and retention for you. Uh, retention is persistence either through a course or through a, uh, a program uh, to completion. And personalization is really individualizing the learning system or the learning process. Uh, so if it, uh, if it aligns with retention or aligns with personalization, that's good, uh, and the rubric helps you to walk through the distinctions uh, between two points and ten points on this. Uh, but that's what we're looking for. It does not, let me be clear, it does not, the proposal does not have to apply to both. Uh, nor is one that applies to both necessarily better than another. A, uh, a proposal that is laser focused on improving retention can get ten points just as another project that uh, has elements of retention and personalization but only sort of could get two points. Um, so we're not looking for tick boxes here. We just want to make certain that it aligns with one or more of those themes. So we'll give a score, we'll put in a comment, and we will move on. Next, R&D team, the research and development team is well prepared to execute the project. The question here is, can this team do it? Look at the names, look at those the bios of the individuals on the team and ask yourself the question, can these individuals realistically complete this project based on who they are? Uh, as I said, this grant process is open for uh, students, staff, or faculty. Sometimes these are first-time researchers. Are they going to be able to handle a $40,000 budget if they've never run a project before? Probably not. So hopefully there are members of their team that have some of that research experience, that have some of that project management experience. Uh, and if you see them on the team, then that can help to get a higher score. If you see those individuals missing, then maybe it's a lower score. Uh, we also give extra points for uh, multidisciplinary teams or teams that reach outside of Penn State. Um, often the, the expert on what you're trying to do is not the person next door to you. Uh, it can be somebody five miles away, 50 miles away, 500 miles away. Uh, so did the team uh, bring the best people to the table in a reasonable way uh, to be able to conduct this project? Uh, if, a, if a project has an engineering component to it and there's nobody from engineering on the team, that raises a red flag for me. These are the things that you'd want to think through. Uh, so you can give it a score, give a comment, and move to the next. Applicability. Uh, basically this means is this a niche project or uh, can this be used outside of that course, that section, that group of students uh, with which it's being piloted or with which it's being used in this particular project. Uh, can it be used outside of Penn State? Uh, or is this really a tool that's going to benefit one faculty member's one course that they teach? Uh, applicability. We want something that's larger than that, that has wide applicability, uh, and that will help you determine the scores in this section. Cost effectiveness. This money comes from Penn State World Campus. Uh, a portion of revenues from Penn State World Campus is funneled into this grant program to help, to, uh, help support it. Uh, and the idea here is that we're reinvesting money from our learners into improving learning and improving the learning experience. So we have to be great stewards of this money. This is tax money and this is student tuition dollars. Uh, so we take that charge very, very seriously. And we want you to think through, is this project a good use of the money? Um, is, is the budget detailed? Does it, the narrative explain why they want to use those funds? And is it convincing? Uh, are they reasonable? Uh, or could this project have been done for half the amount uh, that, that they're asking for? They're asking for $40,000, but there's really no reason it couldn't have been done for twenty. Uh, it is amazing how many projects come out at exactly $40,000 uh, when your limit is $40,000. Our limit used to be $50,000, and 
amazing number of proposals used to come in at $50,000 as well. Uh, so look through that budget, look through those numbers, and, and get a sense of whether or not you think it is a cost-effective uh, use of that money. Feasibility. This is the, so we talked about the R&D team. Can the R&D team do it? But let's also think about feasible. Even if you have the best people at the table, can you do this project for the time in the time allotted and for the money that they're asking for? Um, I have seen in the past uh, proposals where they have allotted $500 or less uh, once for uh, coding and developing a software platform from the ground up. And they were going to do it in about two months. Uh, without something to start from, that is unreasonable. That's not going to happen. As someone who's worked on a number of different software development uh, uh, projects, it's just unreasonable. And so I look at this and say, or I should say unfeasible, because I look at this and I say, is this project feasible in the 12 to 18 months that they have to do the project? And can it be done for the amount of money that they're asking for? The limit's $40,000, and some projects simply can't be done for $40,000. Um, and so there's a question you have to ask yourself on this criterion. R&D plan, or research and evaluation plan, I'm not asking you to be a methodological expert here. Um, I'm not asking you if the, uh, the research plan or the research questions are perfect and, uh, and the ideal uh, method for conducting the research related to this project. What I do ask, is it reasonable? Are the questions the right questions? Can they be researched? Uh, it, are there research or evaluation questions? If it's a development project, are they doing an evaluation to see whether that product works or not? Um, and these are the types of questions come up. And again, we give you bullet points for thinking through uh, that we are not looking for uh, a treatise on on the methodologies related to the projects. What we are looking for is just to think through: is the plan there? Is it appropriate? Are there goals and objectives? And are any assessments aligned or uh, in the proposal aligned with those goals or objectives? Uh, yeah, how many people will review a single proposal between nine and eleven? Uh, all depending on on how it works out. Uh, so we'll see. And that's assuming that everyone does all their all their reviews. Uh, one of the last uh, criteria: proposal or potential to generate subsequent research and funding. These are seed proposal seed grants. Uh, these aren't the forest is is grown grants. Uh, so we are trying to put a little bit of money in people's hands to get these innovative ideas off the table, off the ground, and hoping that once they're done with coil, they're going to then have a proof of concept, a minimally viable product, something that they can then bring to the next level of funding, the NSFs, the NIHs, the IESs, somebody uh, that could bring larger dollar amounts to the table to expand uh, the, on the idea. So what we want to know is, do you think that this idea is going to be attractive outside of Penn State? Are there external funders that would be interested in this? And the PI should have done some of this work. And one of the things that most include is a short list of grant programs that are already out there that would be aligned with their idea uh, to make the case that there is external funding. So we'll give that a score. And we go to the last criteria, which is the dissemination plan. You will notice this is only worth three points. Uh, but it is important to us that there is some sort of plan for getting the word out about their projects. Uh, if a project is funded, we want people to know about it. Uh, we want to get the word out. And whether that's doing a COIL conversation, I love it if they leverage COIL resources for doing this since it's COIL money. Uh, but more traditionally, uh, conference presentations uh, for, um, for publications, for white papers, uh, things of that sort, workshops that they might run. Those are all perfectly valid forms of dissemination. And then get up to three points for their dissemination plan. Now, at that point, you are done with your review for the proposal. But I ask one more thing, and this is this is new. So we get 30 submissions, or we had, I'm sorry, we had 28 this round, 28 submissions. We're going to fund probably three, maybe four, but probably three. 25 likely great ideas are not going to be funded, and I take it very seriously. Um, the uh, a, a role for myself, I take very seriously um, that. 
the PIs are trusting me with their ideas. And I don't want those ideas just to fall by the wayside because they weren't selected. Uh, so one of the things that I do after each round is I try to help make connections between people at our university and beyond for uh, finding, if nothing else, capacity to keep these ideas going, uh, to keep the ideas alive and to move them forward, whether or not there's money behind it. And one of the things that you can do to help me is in this making connections uh, question is, is there anybody that pops into your mind immediately that should know about this project that wasn't on the team that you don't see listed in the proposal? It happens all the time. Uh, in fact, two proposals we have are related to using mobile telepresence robots. They had no idea the other person was doing any research related to this. The two proposals are very close to one another. Uh, those are connections that should be made. And so this is the opportunity for you to let me know, hey, Brad, you should think about making the connection between this project and someone else or something else. Uh, so if you don't have anything to, to give me, that's fine. If you have something that would be uh, that would be helpful to principal investigators, that would be fine. If you want to say yourself, if you want to say, I'm really interested in this project and whether or not it's funded, I want to get in contact with the PIs, that's great and I will help facilitate those connections afterward. Thanks. Yeah, Adeline, it's something new and it's something that I've been doing myself, uh, but it is always best to crowdsource uh, because uh, we are all smarter than any one of us. Uh, so hopefully you can help me make some connections uh, for these projects uh, beyond the, the, uh, the rig process here. So you do that, and you click that last arrow button, almost last arrow button, and you will see you come to a screen that says you are almost done. You are not finished yet at this point. You are not finished until you click this button one last time, and it says we thank you for the time spent taking this survey. Now you are done. It has been submitted and we now have your response. What you do then is you go back into the box folder, you go to your next proposal, you download it, read it, maybe do your worksheet, look over the rubric, and go back to that link again and you will start all over asking you for the password and you will start over the review. You'll do that four times a minimum. If you want to do more, that's great. Uh, but that's it. That's, that's the process. Uh, those are the criteria. That's the process. Uh, important dates you will have from 10 a.m. tomorrow uh, when I get the assignments out to you until Tuesday, May 31st uh, to conduct your four reviews. Uh, and then I, that is by 5 p.m. Uh, so close of business on the, on the 31st. I will then take them and the next day, <coughs> excuse me, on the 31st you will submit um, your reviews. By the next day, 10 a.m., you will have an Excel spreadsheet sent to you that will have a basic statistical analysis of all reviews, as well as a ranking of all the proposals. And you will also receive some letters either telling you, we really need you at the reviewer meeting, uh, which reviewer meeting is Friday, June 3rd, from 2.30 to 4. Either we really need you there, or None of your proposals were in the top 10. So if you'd like to come, you're more than welcome, but don't feel an obligation to come to the reviewer meeting. Uh, we will spend the vast majority of our time talking about the top 10 proposals. There's no reason to, to take up your valuable time talking about proposals that really are not under consideration. Uh, so we, we make that artificial line, that arbitrary line at 10. Uh, and you will also, some of you, will also receive a request from me to serve as chief advocates for proposals. Uh, so if you seem to have really gotten the idea, really understood the proposal, I'll ask you to represent that proposal in the reviewer meeting, if it's one of the top 10. Uh, so 10 out of the 73 reviewers uh, will, will be asked to do that. Um, but that's it. Um, so from this point forward, you'll get an email uh, from me tomorrow with some of these details. Uh, you will receive access to this box folder. You will receive access to the proposals. Uh, and then you are left out in the wild to do this uh, until the 31st. I am always available. Uh, in fact, I make myself available by phone from 7 a.m. until 10 p.m. I am in the office from 7 a.m. until 4 p.m., uh, 4.30 p.m. usually most days. Uh, so you can get me on phone. You can get me on Skype. Uh, you can email me, and I will try to respond as fast as I possibly can. Uh, but my job for the next two and a half weeks is to make this as easy as possible on you. 
and I take that very seriously. Uh, so if there's anything that I can do, any questions I can answer, do not hesitate for a second to reach out to me. And I will do anything that I can for you. Um, and that's it. Thank you. I told you, you're going to get sick of hearing me say thank you, but uh, I will continue to do so because we couldn't do this without you. Uh, there, there's no way we'd be able to make the selections for projects that we make. There is no way that the successes we've had with this rig process would have happened if it weren't for the generosity, the time, the expertise, and the insights of our reviewer team. Um, so you are all rock stars in my book. So thank you for that. Uh, if it doesn't seem like questions, I don't see anything. Oh, I'm sorry, Adelaide, I did miss that. Uh, what platform venue are we using for the connections? Coil Connector. Uh, long story about that one, Coil Connector uh, was, a, uh, was a beta, didn't quite work out, uh, but we're developing something else. Uh, but for right now, it's going to be good old-fashioned Brad with things of that sort uh, until we get something in place. So, With that, thank you very much. A recording of this session will be available uh, tomorrow morning. And if you have any questions whatsoever, feel free to reach out. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of your day.